Get in on the action and make your bet with Sports Interaction. The F1 schedule is heating up. Will you go with the O, Reliable, and Max Verstappen, or take your chance with a potential surprise? Download the app in Ontario. Use the QR code you see at the bottom of your screen somewhere. Or head to sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn to get started. 19 plus, please play responsibly. Welcome to Nailing the Apex. I'm Tim Haraney. Please head on over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow. Same goes with Apple Podcasts as well. Rate a review as it really helps us grow the show. You can follow me on social media at Tim Haraney. Today, we're joined by a very special guest from NBC Sports, broadcaster Lee Diffie. Lee, thanks very much for doing this, man. How are you? Tim, great to be on the uh, on the podcast, video cast, whatever it is. Great to be with yeah. you. I don't ever know what to call these things, if it's podcast, vodcast. I mean, I see Sky Sports F1 is now doing a, a vodcast, so maybe that's what it is. Why don't, why don't we just call it a chat? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, if you want more from Lee, you can get him on social media at Lee Diffie. So, uh, Lee, again, thanks very much for doing this. So if we go back to, oh, boy, I want to say 2003, 2004, 2005. I think you were calling some of my races back then, uh, Champ Car Atlantic. So you had started at uh, Speed TV or Speed Channel. How did you get from Australia to Speed Channel? <laughs> I went via the UK. I went via, yeah. the, B- I went via the BBC. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a long journey. That's a that's a that's a quick question, Tim, with a long answer. But um, yeah, give it to me, man. I want to hear it. I want to know how you got over here because that's this is awesome. <laughs> well, it's it was it was a lot of um, a, a lot of pestering people for an opportunity. Uh, a lot of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, a lot of hard work, but also some some good fortune as well. And. Uh, as I like to tell, you know, interns or young people getting into the industry or whatever, is that um, there are lots of opportunities out there. Not everybody, um, you know, a lot of people can see the opportunities. Not everybody jumps on the opportunities. And mm-hmm. and um, I think probably back then I was a lot braver than what I am now. And uh, you know, uh, asked for opportunities, and and people, I guess, were uh, were very generous enough to give me those opportunities. But you know, worked in Australian television uh, for a very short period of time. Uh, worked around some great people, some world champions, some domestic champions, and went to a couple of Formula One launches um, in the UK and Europe. And then I ended up going to the 24 Hours of Le Mans, two years in succession to do a documentary and really got the bug for the Northern Hemisphere and uh, wanted to be a small fish in a big pond and had a couple of really great uh, lifetime and career mentors who just said, go, go, what, you got nothing to lose, you can do it. And, um, and within six months of those conversations, I was living in the UK and uh, thanks to another, uh, you know, dear friend, um, met some people at the BBC, got a job calling World Superbikes. And, you know, one thing, it, it's easy to sit back now and look at it and say one thing happened to another. There was a lot of stressful times, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, times thinking <laughs> I may have made the most foolish move of my life. And uh, and then and then it all led to coming here to America. What was working like? Uh, what was it like working at Speed Channel? I mean, I used to watch. I used to watch Speed Channel, Speed TV, Speed. I used, to, I used to watch it as a kid all the time. And then obviously, when I got into racing, you know, consumed that content even more. I mean, I remember. I think it was uh, January. Might have been like January first or, or December, or whatever. It was either the end of December or the beginning of January. They would run these twenty-four hour cycles of WRC. Yeah, yeah. And like I used to record all that on VHS, <laughs> so I could like sit down and watch like Colin McRae and oh my god, man, there's so many memories. What, what was it like working there? Because I mean, it's just motorsports twenty-four-seven. It was awesome. It was awesome, um, and a really special group of people and. Everybody, everybody rowing in the same direction. You know, you were surrounded by like-minded people, and everybody was about motorsport. Um, you know, I've had the fortune for more than a decade now of working at NBC Sports, and it's different because it's a it's a network, and and not only is there the news, the the political, the business, the you know, then sport is just one sliver of the entire network, and then within NBC Sports, motorsport is just one sliver of everything. So it's very it's a very diversified viewpoint and and even for me you know motorsport is just one of the things i work on now in addition to the the winter games the summer olympic games um rugby track and field you know all different things so um even for me now you know it's it's very different but to answer your question working at speed was great um 
just some super people met some great characters and uh, and got some amazing opportunities and like you said you know um you know, we, we used to, at the end of each year before the holidays, we would go in and, and host these sessions where you would do a, a look back. You know, it was the year in review for, for Speed World Challenge, what is now SRO, or a year in review of Grand Am, or a year in review of Champ Car, or whatever, everything we had, a year in review of Formula One. It was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, I used to watch all of it. It was great. I loved every minute of it. Um, yeah, so I mean, Talking about Formula One, I mean, you got signed on to NBC to to start with Formula One, and then did you migrate over and start doing both F1 and IndyCar at the same time? Because I remember you were telling me about having to, like, you, you were at one point, you were in one studio in NBC, and then the same day you had to go from calling, like, I think it was like the Italian Grand Prix or something, going from calling that to, like, Watkins Glen to call the IndyCar race. <laughs> true true story, yeah. I, I wow. did join, I joined NBC at the end of 2012, and um, that was for the purpose of Formula One and IndyCar at the same time, and, and that was going to be in 20, um, 2014 was my first uh, Olympic Games for the network. So it was for everything, but, but it was to call races. But um, my boss has just said, look, you're, you, know, you call races, but motorsport isn't going to be the only race you call. But yeah, have, doing F1 and IndyCar at the same time was, was a dream, a dream for me anyway. Um, unbelievable. And then there were, there were many weekends that clashed. Um, I had to miss IndyCar races because of that. But sometimes when it was close and it was viable, I could do both. And uh, there was one time where Steve Matchett and I did a full Grand Prix weekend, raced to the nearest airport, jumped on a private jet and flew to Pocono. And then we called a 500-mile IndyCar race at Pocono. Another time, like you said, called a full weekend, jumped on the private jet, flew to um, Watkins Glen to call a full IndyCar race. They were, they were fun times, and um, I'm not sure if that'll ever happen again, so, so they're, they're great memories. That's absolutely incredible, and just to have that bank of knowledge, I mean, it's not easy to, you know, do two sports at once, especially do, like, the play-by-play for it, and I mean, for yourself, I mean, how much research did you have to, well, still do, have to put into every time when you go on the air, just knowing every single detail about every athlete you're speaking about? You do a lot. You do a lot of homework, for sure. I have two sons. Um, uh, and I tell them, you know, they're always asking me, Dad, why are you in the office again, Dad? And, you know, I, I honestly do more reading and writing now than I probably did when I was at university um, just because you've got to read so much and because I do a variety of different sports as well. But um, it's hard to do two on the one weekend because while you've got to be focused on one, your mind or a portion of your mind is thinking about the other. And when you would, say, switch off from Formula One, your mind then goes to IndyCar to say, well, what happened in practice? What's happening in qualifying? And while you might have been able to go back to the hotel and have a sleep after F1, I had to stay awake and watch, you know, IndyCar or, or you know, get on the phone and talk to some people. So, they, they, yeah, they were challenging weekends. Man, that's a lot. It's cool, though. <laughs> and now you get to do the Olympics as well. Well, you've been doing the Olympics now for a few years. You just mm-hmm. got done with the... Uh, I guess it was the 2020 Summer Games in uh, Japan. What what was that like? Did you you actually got to go, or did you do that from like the home base? No, we. I've done five games, and I've been to four of them. This most recent one, just over a year ago in Beijing, the the most recent Winter Games, pr- pretty much um, the majority of the broadcasters did not go. Um, our host Mike Tarico, he went for the opening ceremonies and and the first couple of days, and then he came back. He came back. Uh, because we had the Super Bowl. It was NBC's turn to have the Super Bowl that year. So Mike came back and did a day or two of hosting back here, and then, then he went out west for Super Bowl. We had on, on-ground reporters, but and, of course, all you know technical side of things and engineering stuff and logistics stuff, but a lot of the actual commentators, uh, play-by-play and analysts, um, we, were, we were operating out of NBC Sports headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So and that was a little bit weird. That was the first time... You know, we used to do Formula One that way. We would we would only go to select Grand Prix. You know, we would go to Barcelona for preseason testing. We'd do Monaco, Montreal, and then Circuit of the Americas. And then the rest of the Formula One year, we'd do out of Stanford. Uh, so I was used to that, that style, but it was very different. It just felt different to do an Olympics that way um, because, you know, we hadn't done Formula One the other way. Whereas I'd done the Olympics the other way, the normal way or traditional way, so it did feel a bit, it did feel a little bit weird. Now you're just coming off of uh, calling the uh, the race in Texas for IndyCar, um, Lee. <laughs> 
26 lead changes, most in 23 years, apparently. Uh, what was that race like to call? Because it was, it was awesome to watch. It yeah. was unreal. It was so good. It felt like um, a lot of the drivers were kind of describing it as Texas of old. Um, you know, because Texas has an amazing history uh, with IndyCar. There's been a lot of races run there, um, whether in the current, you know, IndyCar um, uh, under the guise of IndyCar or if it was IRL or whatever. There's been a lot. I think that was at the 36th IndyCar race that has happened at Texas Motor Speedway. A lot of great finishes, a lot of side-by-side -side racing, but that kind of went away in recent years due to certain aspects to the track, etc., and the configuration of the cars. So that big black strip that you saw in turns one and two, three and four, that PJ1 that they put down for the, to make it grippier for the NASCAR races, that didn't work. It wasn't applicable to IndyCar, and IndyCar had their struggles to try and make it work. That now longer was, was no longer reapplied, um, so that helped. And then IndyCar changed the aerodynamic configuration, giving, the, the, giving each of the cars um, between two and 300 extra pounds of downforce and just everything there were there were lots of um there were lots of contributing factors that made that made the race what it was and it was awesome i mean i wish there was a bigger crowd there it is what it is um but the racing for us on television and for the fans at home was fantastic yeah just the pack racing mentality of all of it i mean watching some of the videos that some of the drivers have posted i think i just finished watching scott mclaughlin's video he posted today on twitter we're taping this on a on a wednesday and yeah it's 230 miles an hour and he's dicing it up with like the likes of castro neves and david malukas yeah. and yeah absolutely wild scenes i don't think i've seen a pack race like that i think since maybe california 2000 and 15 or 2016 which was a wild race which ended Ooh, with yeah. a pretty crazy way with ryan briscoe you know going flying through the air um it, i i it's you've just sparked a thought by using the phrase pack racing because i think the the good thing about it tim was to a degree there mm -hmm. was a pack but it mm -hmm. wasn't traditional like IRL style pack racing where nobody could move and it was mm -hmm. full, you know, flat to the floor and nobody could go anywhere. To me, that's what pack racing is. At least here, there was lots of maneuverability. You know, if you count every single pass for position, I think, you know, and the, the figures can be skewed a little bit depending on if somebody's coming into the pits or wh whatever it might be, but there was over a thousand on track passes, but you know, which sounds crazy, but. I just think that it was great that people could move around, people go, could go to the front, people could decide they didn't want to lead and sit back to save some fuel in their tyres. If they wanted to go and challenge, they could. So um, there was a pack to your phraseology, but I don't think it was traditional pack racing. And the drivers really enjoyed that, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's scary stuff. But they, mm -hmm. they, they, I mean, to see Colton Herter's comments afterwards, just saying, I, I still can't believe how much fun Sunday was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it was great television too. It was great viewing. I mean, there was some points I was watching it with my partner, and I'm like, I was just looking at it. I'm like, <laughs> someone, there's going to be an accident here. These guys are in this. Sure enough, I think it was like Graham Rahal and Devlin or something. They got together or something like, if I remember correctly. But yeah. oh man, it was such a wild race. It was one of the best races I've watched on television in in, in a few years for sure. It was so exciting. I mean, IndyCar has has gotten off to a bang, Lee. I mean, even with St. Pete, that was a wild race too. Uh, did you um, did you expect it to be this wild coming into this season, given, like, we know what the formula is, right? Like, the cars haven't really changed too much. I mean, there's been a little aerodynamic tweaks here and there. But other than that, you know, it's just that the, I've noticed one thing is just the competition, like the mm -hmm. level, the, the driver, like the level of competition and the talent that's gotten into IndyCar over the last, I would say, two to three years is, man, these guys are just so good now. I, I think to answer your question, um, I have been surprised by what has transpired. But when you come into any IndyCar season, the one thing that you're never surprised by is what you mentioned, the level of competitiveness, right? Because just year after year after year, it gives us that. And maybe by the cars not changing too much, that it's such a stable platform technically that, you know, when you go back to the variables, the variables are the human resource variable. Uh, what kind of engineering staff do you have? You know, what's, what's your crew like? Um, how much, you know, what, what can you do with the suspension, with the dampers, etc.? So 
I think that's why it's so competitive. But I never expected the first two races to start and finish the way that they did. And uh, poor old Romain Grosjean has been in the middle of it at the end, both races. So I think he's... I feel for him because yeah. I think he's driving the best he's driven in his short IndyCar career, and he just hasn't come away with the results. You know, going for the win with Scott McLaughlin in St. Pete, they collide, didn't happen. He was going for... He wouldn't have won Texas, in my opinion, but he certainly could have been on the podium and then, you know, was just the victim of a close call and lost it, and that's why we finished under yellow. Um, but, yeah, it's been an awesome start. And, and, and to your point... I think it's fascinating right now, the eclectic mix of drivers that we have, not necessarily because they're drivers from all over the world, but in terms of age and experience. So you've got your cornerstone legends like Scott Dixon and Will Power and Elio Castro Neves and Simon Pagano and, and Takuma Sato and these guys, you know, in their 40s, late 30s and 40s. But then you've got the youth movement in the Pato Awards, who leads the, leads the championship now. Colton Herder, David Malukas, who's in the top 10 in the points now. You know, just these guys who've come from everywhere. Um, Hunko's Hollinger Racing, they pull a 33-year-old Argentinian out of touring yeah. cars, and he's 12th in the points. He never raced <laughs> on an oval in his life, and he's 12th in the points. Callum Eilod, his teammate, is 7th in the points. I mean, this, this championship this year is just awesome. <laughs> It's great to see, though. I mean, like, I never thought that we would be talking about who goes longer. Right? Exactly. Like, exactly. There are two drivers, like, getting close, like, being in the top 10. I mean, that's absolutely uh, ridiculous. Um, one of the teams that I've actually has really stood out to me quite a bit, obviously, and you, I agree or disagree, but I mean, Errol McLaren has been really impressive considering that like i think it was probably like the first i think it was like the friday of saint pete like it was bad like it didn't it didn't look well for them but the way that they're able to get everything together qualify pretty decently and then pato with a great race and and same and same with uh felix and, and alex as well i mean for the most part um the team just looks super strong don't they i mean like yeah. ever since they brought gavin ward in to kind of restructure some things and, and get that team moving i mean they look they look pretty good. I mean, I, I don't necessarily like to use like the big three or whatever, but I would, I would say we have like a big four now. You know, oh with yeah, with Aaron McLaren. They they spent um they spent the off season just um with one goal in mind, and you know I mentioned the human resource element before. You know they they went and secured um, dozens of new people because they brought on a third car in Alexander Rossi, really talented people. Um, you mentioned Gavin Ward, the Canadian engineer who spent a long time in Formula One and was there in the championship uh, winning years of Vettel at Red Bull uh, and beyond. And, and, you know, he spent time on the Penske box before having a little bit of gardening leave and then and then coming on to, you know, fellow Chevrolet team with Arrow McLaren. But, um, yeah, wherever you point to and wherever you, wherever you look, uh, talent up and down the pit lane, stories up and down the pit lane, and um, it's all building towards the Indianapolis 500. So we couldn't have asked for a better lead up to this year's 500. <laughs> no, for sure. Um, one of the teams that's been struggling a little bit would be RLL. I mean, they've made some big changes behind the scenes, but at this moment, it just doesn't look like anything's really working for them. But I didn't, I mean, you can hear the frustration in Graham's voice whenever he gets out of the car and he does an interview. It's just. I don't know. What do you think, Lee? I mean, any insight into what may be going on there? Because I, I didn't expect them to struggle this much at the beginning of the season. No, I don't think anybody did, especially them. And, you know, I've spoken to the drivers and, and to team management, etc. And, you know, everybody's hoping for a solution and for a resolution. And I just I just don't, you know, it, it's, it's, it's mystifying. You know, it's really mystifying. And Especially a team like that that's race winning, championship contending. Um, you know, Graham's one of the most experienced guys in, in the field. Um, Christian Lungard showed how good he is in his very young career. Jack Harvey, who's been a podium achieving IndyCar driver. So, you know, I mean, if I had the answer, I wouldn't be working on television, would I? I'd be there. <laughs> but but I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't know how they're going to unlock the secrets. They've taken on a lot in recent times with their new facility and they're back with, you know, as our, Team RLL as a racing organization, you know, with their IMSA WeatherTech sports car commitments with BMW being back in the premier class with prototypes. You know, there's a, there's a lot going on at RLL. Um, obviously, the sports car side has got off to a pretty good start. They finished on the podium at, at Sebring. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And that's going to be one of the stories that we'll that we will follow because... 
what, who, when, and how is that mystifying secret going to be unlocked for them to find speed again because that's the, that's the one thing that graham ray hall i spent quite a bit of time with him last weekend in texas he just kept saying we got no speed like it's just not there so man even to see like sometimes you know jack harvey it's been tough for him as well at, at that team so far this season i mean you know, everything that happened to him and in, in st pete and everything that last season as well, but then the season before that, he was just so strong when he was with Shank, and now all of a sudden he just, I don't know, the pace just isn't there right, right now, and he's a fast driver, so it just doesn't all make, doesn't all make total sense. Um, I see you've got uh, Logan Sargent, I believe, hey, hey. on your... <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so, all right, let's talk about uh, Americans in Formula One because... We're not going to talk know, about the end of the Australian Grand Prix, okay? We're not going to talk about Logan at the end of the Australian Grand oh, Prix. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, cold tires and uh, brake temp just not there, I don't think. And I think he was just expecting it to be and just was. I mean, it happened to everybody. He wasn't the only sure, one that exactly. was battling with it for uh, that last lap of the race. Um, Joseph Newgarden, he in my opinion, was always one of those drivers who I thought that deserved uh, a chance in, in an F1 car. Super talented guy. I mean, like, you look at every IndyCar season, even when he moved over to Penske, he's, he's been in it. He's been there um, battling for a championship. Uh, this season, no different. I mean, he's fourth in the IndyCar standings, I believe. And then on top of that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Colton Herta in the past, especially last season. Um when you look at those two drivers, uh, what? I mean, maybe not for Joseph, but for Colton, what do you think it's going to take for him to get a chance uh, at, at an F1 ride? Well, I mean, the whole super license points thing frustrates me enormously. Um, the rules are the rules, and that's that's been established, right? And I know and appreciate that, but. It, can they change those, mm -hmm. not just for Colton, but going forward? You know, I mean, a guy who has sat on the front row of the Indianapolis 500, won multiple IndyCar races, is one of the standout performance performers in IndyCar, you know, arguably one of, if not the highest paid driver in IndyCar. Um, but the FIA says, no, you're not good enough because you don't have, and yet there's kids literally kids mm -hmm. in junior categories, but because they're FIA, they're within the FIA structure of, of scoring super points, uh, so super license points, they're more qualified for Formula One than Colton Herter. I mean, it just, it makes no sense. And I'm not saying they need to break the rules for Colton. I'm saying system-wide, they need to take a look at how do you make it more applicable? Um, you know, um, are you are you telling me that Nikita Mazepin was more qualified to be in Formula One than Colton Herder? Not a chance. But the circumstances dictated, and he went through the FIA feeder system, and that's why he had his super license and you know the family wealth and everything else. And so, but anyway, look, I just think having this guy in in Formula One now is you know we've seen the growth of Formula One in popularity here in the states due to numerous reasons drive to survive the american ownership the the proliferation of american companies now involved in formula one now this year three formula one grand prix here in the states you know there's numerous reasons to that rise in popularity having logan there and the more experience he gets it's only going to help and he's a terrific young driver um i think you know as he said his own words melbourne didn't work out just as he would like but i think he's doing fine and you, you got to give every rookie a mulligan year so it doesn't really matter what happens this year. He's going to get valuable experience and learn a heck of a lot. Um, and, Al and Albon, despite the, the unfortunate and poor result for the Williams team in Melbourne, I think Albon's starting to show the potential of that car. Um, key personnel changes at Williams. And so I think, you know, I think even though we're not talking about winning Grand Prix or standing on the podium, I think the future's mm -hmm. looking bright f for this young American. Yeah, and Alex is a, Alex is a fast fast driver man i i think he's he's probably got the, some of the best car control on that grid and considering that that car is not easy easy to drive i mean logan's done very good job i would say if you go back to Jeddah and you take a look at his progression throughout each session at that track because it's such an intimidating track and for a driver to crash there you lose confidence so quickly and for the team to 
kind of walk him through each session so he can get up to speed. So by the time he gets to qualifying, he is close to Alex's pace or close to the limit of the car. He did prove that, and then if it wasn't for just a tiny little mistake about putting the left front just, just off a bit on that straightaway and get penalized and have that lap taken away, he would have qualified probably 13th, 14th yeah. uh, for the race. I mean, he's fast. I mean, there's no question about it. The talent's there. He deserves it. He was worked hard. Um, I agree with you on the fact that, like, I think the FIA needs to take a look at, like, how they issue super license points to IndyCar drivers because if you look at what IndyCar drivers have to do, I mean – you know, you're wrestling a 800, 900 horsepower Indy car around ovals, street circuits, uh, road tr- road courses, super speedways, short ovals. There's so many different skill levels that are involved. And, you know, you take a driver like Roman Grosjean, for instance, like quick, but still has a little bit to learn once he gets to the ovals. And that's what Will Power always used to say as well. It's like one of the hardest things for him to learn was – was the ovals and to get that experience and i mean you're hauling ass into turn one at ims uh, like well like over 300 kilometers an hour it's just it doesn't it doesn't make sense i mean just simply because of the amount of experience these drivers have to have um to compete in the sport i think they're deserving of more super license points uh within the sport itself but obviously that's a a different topic for a different day because I don't have you for very much longer. Let's but, do that. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's do that calculation. I just looked down at my phone. I thought, I've got my calculator here. Let's do that. Let's do that calculation. Ready? Oh, man. Uh, what, what is that? That calculation is that you said uh, how long into it? They do 243 miles an hour miles an hour into turn one so that's way over 350 kilometers an hour which is wild man mental wild absolutely wild um yeah, I want to talk a bit more Formula One with you before, before you take off. Because, you got to talk you know, about Lance Stroll, don't you? And Aston yeah, Martin. Well, well, I've talked about him quite a bit on the podcast for sure. Um, he's had a he's had a really good season. I mean, obviously, I keep telling people. I mean, for Lance, that I've known Lance for forever. I mean, like, he's been fast in pretty much anything he's ever driven. So I wouldn't expect this him not to be fast here. And yeah, just having that bicycling incident uh before the start of the season and then you're not getting all the testing and so it takes a while to get the confidence to, to yeah. really push push the car but he's done well so far i mean that whole aston martin team is man they look goodly Woo. just think about just think about take let's not even talk about results okay let's just talk about a canadian kid who's pretty much no longer a kid right time flies by but let's talk about this canadian driver who this year, combined with the last couple of years, has been shoulder to shoulder in engineering debriefs, hanging around with two of the greatest drivers Formula One's ever seen, Sebastian Vettel and Fernando Alonso. Like, I mean, just think about that. Forget any results. Just what he gleans from them, what he absorbs from them, and especially this year with what's happened with that car, what Fernando's been doing, what Lance himself's been doing. I mean, you know, when when at, in Melbourne at the weekend when they had the last stoppage, which was obviously d- determined the outcome of the race and how, how the race was going to finish, I should say, um, you know, to see Lawrence Stroll on the pit box and Lance came wandering over and they had a big, like, high-five, handshake, whatever it was, you know. You can tell the spirit is high in that team, you know, and it's just, it's been, for me, it's been the story of this year, you know. It's not it's not Red Bull or Max's pace or is Lewis going to win again? Or To me, they aren't, they're, they're, they're the other stories. It's Everyone's talking about Alonso and Aston Martin. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just because of the jump they even made. And I think, you know, if you go back to... If you go back to last season, they were, if not the slowest car on the grid in Bahrain. And as the season sort of progressed and you saw them bring that massive upgrade to the car uh, for the Spanish Grand Prix, and then they built it on built on top of that. And then by the time they came out, came out of summer break, every upgrade that they brought to the car, it worked. They hit a home run with it. And then that was enough for them to claw their way into seventh in the constructor standings. And then you look at... You look at what they were able to do in the offseason. I mean, Lee, that car is 95% brand new. They only kept 5% from last year's car. And usually you just kind of build up on top of that. So 
I mean, really impressive job from Aston Martin for sure, no, no doubt about it. Um, uh, Tim, I'm for, disappointed. For, for, How far we're, we're we're over half an hour into this, and you haven't asked me about Oscar Piastri scoring his gonna, first point. I was just going to do it, man. I was just going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, uh, he's looked really good, like really good, considering he's been out of a car for like a year. I mean, Oscar's, you know, I think Oscar's given Lando everything he can handle since uh, since Jetta in that race. He's he's looked really good. So, like a, a really weird situation, isn't it? One Aussie yeah. out in Daniel Ricciardo and yeah. one Aussie in in Oscar Piastri and an awkward thing like it's similar to what happened here with the IndyCar with a contractual dispute and I'm driving for them, no, you're driving for me, no, I'm driving for them. You know, just it was a very inauspicious start. Um, and then, you know, early, uh, I was a bit kind of surprised at, at Oscar's qualifying. I thought, oh, I thought this might be, now you're starting to see him find his feet and circumstances are good. And, you know, I, Mark Webber is an old mate of mine and, and Mark has, you know, mentioned just how, just how skilled this kid is, you know, just how mature he is, which is a really important point. Um, and so I think it's going to, it's going to come to fruition uh, in terms of everything that Zach Brown and McLaren want with these two young stars, you know, Lando is arguably already a bit of a superstar, um, that they're going to push each other and it's going to be, McLaren's going to be the winner for it. And we're, we're going to be the winners just watching it from an entertainment spectacle. Um, I think it's really good. And I don't know, I didn't hear it on the broadcast. I may have missed it, but I found it particularly interesting because I called the race when it happened um, is that Oscar replicated what his manager, Mark Webber, did in 2002, and that is scoring yeah. points on points. debut at yeah. the Australian Grand Prix. Although yeah. Mark did a little bit better, because back then we're so old. <laughs> the car was... Then, you had, he was driving a Minardi, and, <laughs> and he only scored points to six, Tim. So Mark yeah. had to... You know, Mark was fighting with Mika Salo in the Toyota back then, and he, that's where he scored his first points. So pretty cool story for those two guys. Yeah, Mika Salo spun off, and Mark avoided the, all the pressure that he was putting yeah. on him for so many yeah. laps. Yeah. <laughs> it was impressive. I love that race. I, I remember watching that as a kid, and I was cheering for Mark the whole way around. It was pretty impressive. Um, what was the uh, reception like for for Oscar back in Australia when he scored when he scored his points? I mean, do you have any friends or family that were at the race or anyone? Yeah, you know? yeah. I had some buddies working there, and, and they just said it was fantastic. You know, cool. because um, I don't, I'm not sure what the parallel you could draw. You know, Canadians and hockey, or you know, whatever it might be. Aussies are parochial sports fans. You know, they, they love it. Um, you know, they gave Mark Webber a heck of a time when he hadn't won a Grand Prix yet. And, you know, they were wondering when Danny Ricciardo, when he was going to win a Grand Prix. And so we're, it's a, they're pretty insatiable for success on the sporting arena, uh, in the sporting arena. So they would have been so proud of him. It was a great atmosphere. I want to say it coincided with Sir Jack Brabham's birthday, so it was all pretty special, like what happened for Piastri on home soil. Because poor old Danny Rick, he didn't really have a whole lot of luck at home. And nor did Mark, actually. It was the, the, the home Grand Prix was kind of their nemesis almost. Um, it was their kryptonite to a certain degree. And because of the, the craziness surrounding it and the media demands and the sponsor demands and everything else, and then the pressure and the friends and the family, I, I can tell you that they enjoyed getting out of there. Not mm -hmm. because to get away from their home nation, but just to get away from that additional pressure. Mm -hmm. And I think every driver feels that in their home Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for Oscar to do that was huge in, in, in his first year as well. Yeah, I remember uh, Daniel Ricciardo making mention of that when he was with uh, when he was with Renault. He had taken on his first year with Renault. He'd taken on too many media responsibilities, and I remember he said for the next year he was coming back. He was going to make sure that he had didn't take on too much because there was just so much of it and it added so much pressure um, to him in the, in the whole weekend. Uh, Lee, this has been great. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts before we take off on uh, Ferrari. And uh, if you see a way back to, let's just say the podium for Ferrari. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not Catholic, Tim, but should I do this? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. It may I work. don't know. I don't know. I have a lot of friends who are just so they're passionate, passionate Ferrari um, fans that are of Italian descent uh, here in North America and around the world, and they just you know they're forever, they're forever optimistic, they're forever hopeful. They got two awesome drivers. Change at the top. I mean, if Fred Vasseur can get them back on track and 
somehow get them to start winning Grand Prix again, that will be it'll be pretty awesome. Um, yeah, it's kind of like just as a, a you know as an F1 broadcaster and as a huge F1 fan, I really hope what happened to Vettel at Ferrari doesn't happen to Leclerc at mm-hmm. Ferrari because he's just so good and I would hate to see him come to the end of his tenure there and not bring well it doesn't matter even him or science to bring Mm -hmm. Ferrari that next world championship I mean they haven't won a world championship since Kimi Raikkonen in 2007 that's you know that's a long time that's too long for Ferrari for you know the, the team that is the hub of the sport you can't we you know it's crazy especially got all those resources and everything as well. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I thought last year, I thought that was going to be the year for Ferrari and just everything that went against them and some of it themselves with, uh, you know, obviously of driver mistakes, we have reliability and then you have tactics on top of that that just didn't really work out. So yeah, I, it, it'll be interesting. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how the rest of this F1 season goes when teams start to bring their big upgrades to the car and, I'll be interested to see if they're able to close close down that gap to, to Red Bull. Not necessarily the one lap pace, but more essentially the race pace. Like, try to gain that back and get better with the tire dag. Uh, for me, that'll be interesting to see. And I think we're going to have our first big upgrade on uh, McLaren in, in Baku. So, uh, we'll see what happens there with Norris in, uh, in Piastri, eh, Lee? <laughs> hey, and, 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 and to quote Otmar Safnauer at the end of the Australian Grand Prix, We've still got 20 to go. Yeah. yeah 20 exactly. Grand Prix, that is. So yeah, exactly. longest season ever in the history of the sport. So we'll, um, you know, there's, there's lots of time to, to talk lots about what's going on and to see who's where. But, I mean, as you know, it's, it's the old saying, it's the old adage, if Ferrari's winning, it's good for Formula yeah. One. It's good for Always. Ferrari, it's good for Formula One. So we need either Leclerc or Sainz back on that top step just to, to, to mix it up a little bit, you know. And we- I, think, I think, too, that for Variety... I was so enthused when I saw George Russell get that start and mix it up with Max, and it was a shame what happened to him. But I think, to me, more so than the first two Grand Prix, uh, I think Australia really showed what potential is out there for this F1 season, and I, meaning meaning the variability and diversity. I'm pretty sure that Verstappen will go on and win another world championship. That yeah. that seems pretty obvious at the moment, but anything anything that can mix it up a little bit is going to be great for the sport. Yeah, 100%. Lee, thanks very much for your time uh, in doing this. This has been great. If you want more from Lee Diffie, you can get him on social media, at Lee Diffie. Uh, Dude, this has been great. Thanks again, man. Well, Tim, thanks for having me on. And, and mate, don't you stop being you because you're one of the most passionate and enthusiastic people in the industry. So don't don't you change, mate. Keep your foot to the floor. (laughs) Thanks, pal. I appreciate it.